And so you can see here, this application is really simple. And the, um, we only have one bypass valve, which you, can, which you can see here, which bypasses the entire system, including the intercooler, including the supercharger, including the turbocharger, and just feeds fresh air directly from the air intake all the way into our intake manifold. The reason we use this bypass valve here is that it improves throttle response. And this is what I wanted to mention to you earlier when I said we were going to talk about response. Um, if the turbocharger isn't pre-spooled, if you're in a really low RPM range, or if you if you sharply increase your throttle by just uh, you know hammering the throttle pedal down, then the time required for the supercharger to spin up or your turbocharger to get up to speed is going to hinder your airflow through this long convoluted path all the way to your intake manifold. During that period. There's a high amount of vacuum in the manifold, and you can see this black line is our vacuum line. And the diaphragm here in our blow-off slash bypass valve senses that there's a high vacuum on this side of the diaphragm, and there's a normal air pressure coming in from the intake manifold on this side of the diaphragm. That vacuum opens the, di the diaphragm and allows the air to flow through the bypass valve all the way to the intake manifold to feed it momentarily until the supercharger and turbocharger come back up to speed and then we start to build pressure in this part of the system where the high vacuum condition here drops off comes back to here and then the valve closes and then you're running in boost where air is coming through this path here so switching over between this short path for response and this other path for boost and high power is why I use this combination blow off valve slash bypass valve and I'm assuming here that the throttle pedal, the throttle plate is located right here. So if you close the throttle plate and your turbocharger and supercharger are still spinning, then the boost pressure that's trapped between the throttle plate and your chargers will also be able to blow off through this valve and just circulate back into the system. Just go and circulate all the way through here until you finish your shift. If you're going between shifts and then you open the throttle plate again. This valve closes, and then all the boost that's been circulating around in the system will be allowed to get back into your intake manifold so you can get back on the power. So this is my basic twin charger arrangement. Uh, one last thing here I'll show you is this is our... Uh, this is me illustrating the wastegate, which controls the boost pressure on the turbocharger. And you're probably going to want to have an adjustable boost controller, which tees in or bleeds off your vacuum reference line coming from your intake manifold. Um, the reason I'm showing all, you all of this is because we're going to talk about what the power calculator does. And uh, version 3.3 of the power calculator now is able to give you the dimensions of your, in, your cold side intake system, your turbocharger that matches your application, your hot side intake system, which is after the turbo, the compressed air, the right size supercharger for your application, again, your hot side intake system, your intercooler dimensions for your target power level, your water injection amount, your intake manifold dimensions, throttle body, plenum volume, runner diameters, runner length for resonance tuning, your exhaust manifold dimensions, including your runner diameters and runner length for tuning. Uh, your wastegate size, which is the minimum size you need for your wastegate to be able to control the boost pressure. And your exhaust size, which is the size of the exhaust you're going to need for the best combination of response and power. All of what you see in front of you here, even including your uh, piston static compression ratio, all of these figures are all calculated by the power calculator, version 3.3 or higher. And so what I'm going to show you now is that the calculation that took me about two hours to do to write that article, which was so popular, you can do in about three minutes using the power calculator. Before we move on to that, there's two last points I want to make. One is that when you're talking about a twin charged application, there's a lot of factors coming into uh, properly metering and tuning the airflow that comes into the engine. Um, you have a turbocharger which has a certain efficiency range 
the changes with different RPM levels or different ambient air conditions. You have a supercharger that has the same kind of considerations. Having to do with the supercharger efficiency and what RPM you're operating at and what boost level you're operating at and what your intake air temperatures are. You have your intercooler, which has its own efficiency and has problems with heat soak or airflow or different things that can happen with there. And the combination of these three factors means that the intake air temp, as measured here at the throttle body, will vary with the same setup from condition to condition. Your intercooler might heat soak, your turbocharger, there might be a small leak between your turbo and supercharger, your turbo will be working out of its efficiency range, the air will superheat. Um, there's a lot of things that can go on with this kind of system. And what people usually do is they usually meter the airflow here in the cold side of the intake system. They'll have their temperature sensor in here and their boost sensor in the intake manifold. And they'll just make an assumption about the final temperature of the air mixture entering into the manifold and use that for tuning their timing tables. And that's a big mistake with this kind of system because there is, frankly, a big range of variation that you can have depending on the healthiness of your chargers, depending on heat soak, depending on what's going on your, in your system, if you have any boost leaks or if you have anything going on like that. Um, what I would recommend doing in this kind of system is using a blow-through setup. A blow-through setup is where if you had a your mass airflow sensor, rather than having it on the cold side of the intake, having it right here, where I have the black marker, right before your throttle body. If you have your airflow mass air metering, boost pressure, air temp sensor located right here before your throttle body, then what you're measuring and what you're sending to your computer is going to be the final mixture um, temperature, density, or air mass of the mixture after it goes through your turbocharger, your supercharger, and your intercooler. So you're always going to get a final reading, and you're not going to make an assumption. See, if you're making your temperature and flow readings over here, then you have no idea what combination of temperature, pressure, and density you're working with back here. And that variation is going to be a variation in your tune. And that variation in your tune, in your timing, in the appropriate amount of fuel and timing that you have into the system is going to affect your response. It's going to affect the reliability of your motor. It's going to affect your power delivery. And so on this kind of set setup, it's really a good idea to have a blow-through style map where you locate your metering sensors on as close as possible to the throttle body. Um, the reason I'm spraying the water injection, as you see this arrow here, after the, the mass airflow sensor is you're probably not going to want to spray water into your airflow sensor. It's going to damage the sensor element and short it out. But still, spraying as close as, or metering as close as possible to the throttle body is going to be the best approach for this kind of a setup. The other thing I want to talk, to talk about here is a slightly different setup here. Um, some cars have a supercharger system where the supercharger is built into the intake manifold. And then what that does is that doesn't give you the opportunity to have an intercooler after the supercharger. And when we talked about the compounded compression between the turbo turbocharger and the supercharger, um, that gives you an overall charger that has a lower thermal efficiency because you're compressing the air twice and overheating the air. Um, in this kind of application, what you want to do is you want to send your supercharger out to somebody like uh, Magnuson and have the supercharger rotors coded so that they can uh, properly deal with water and alcohol injection. There's a special kind of coating that's compatible with water and alcohol injection. And then what you're going to do is you're going to use your water injection right before the supercharger as your second stage of cooling. And you're going to try to use a, uh, a regular air-to-water, air-to-air intercooler between your turbocharger and your supercharger. So you're going to cool the air once, then you're going to cool it again with chemical cooling as it enters into the supercharger. So that's a slight variation on the system, but it's probably going to require you to get the supercharger rotors coated to be able to cope with the water alcohol injection without eating into the coating or damaging the rotors.